Welcome everybody to Lecture 8, Information Retrieval in the Spring 2022. We will talk about uh, the vector space model today, so change of topic. It's a very short lecture, but before that we will talk a little bit more about the last lecture. And uh, in particular your experiences with the last exercise sheet that was web app part two. I will show a demo of some of your web apps. I will talk a little bit more about encoding because we didn't have much time for it. In the last lecture I just told you what you needed to do the exercise sheet. But there's a few more interesting things to say and I will be happy to happy to explain them to you. And then the vector space model, and now so it's, we are switching to linear algebra mode. It's very nice, and I'm sure you will like it. And the exercise sheet 8 will be, go back to the roots, to the beginning, exercise sheet 2, and then uh, you just do everything with linear algebra now, and we will see the connection today. And let me just check whether the pen works while Frank is still here. It works great. Okay. So, your experiences, and it let's also look at some of your demos. Most of you like the sheet and the lecture uh, a lot. It's not easy, some problems with multiprocessing. Here are some quotes, very nice and very informative. Some problems, yes, because there are so many different uh, things that was also said in the lecture. But I really liked it anyway because of exactly this. And I liked this comment because that was kind of the purpose of the lectures and the exercise sheet. All these things, pretty simple by themselves, but the combination of so many things is really hard and, and so many things can go wrong. And the only way to learn this really is by doing it yourself. If you just listen, you don't learn it. Can you increase the line limit for these exercises? This is a recurring theme over the year. We have a pretty strict uh, limit of 80 lines, which doesn't, uh, 80 characters per line, actually only 79, which doesn't come from us. It's the default by Flake8, our Python style checker. And I've wrote a post about this in a forum, which you can read. I mean, yeah, the essence is every software project, every company, every organization has such rules. You just need them, and there are good reasons for them. Yeah, unfortunately, we also made that experience afterwards. Uh, Python is just not made. Python and multiprocessing does not go together. <coughs> and actually, by something I explained in the last lecture, one can even understand why we learned that JavaScript is single-threaded. You can do asynchronous stuff, but in, it's inherently single-threaded because the interpreter, Python, like uh, JavaScript, like Python, is an interpreted language, and the interpreter always looks at one line at a time, never two lines. So the interpreter is not uh, multi-threaded because then you would have all kinds of problems with uh, shared data structures and so on. Python it's the same thing so there's a global interpreter lock when the interpreter looks at this line of Python it can't at the same time look at another line which means you can't really do multiprocessing in Python the only way to do it is you fork the whole Python process, which means you have two interpreters, three interpreters, and then if you have three threads, you have the same thing running three times, which also means the same amount of memory, which was the problem for the exercise sheet, because your QGram index was quite, it used four gigabytes or so if you worked with a whole data set, which means then you have two times, three times, five times four gigabyte. Has kindled an interest in building web interfaces, nice. And uh, many of you wrote that it's great to see right in these last two exercise sheets, everything we did so far came together from the first lecture to the fuzzy search and the web app stuff. So let's look at uh, some of your demos. We have prepared some of them. So here we have uh, Freigel. Okay, so many of you were inspired by the... And let's just... Okay, so what do we have here? We have a drop-down menu. Let's see. Oh, we even have, okay. So all kinds of interesting stuff you could do here. If you arrow key and then I, okay, I can click on something and I get to the page. Let's, so what else do we have here? 
Okay, an error message. Interesting. Here we have some Star Wars uh, animation. Nice. <coughs> what if I have a file name which doesn't exist? More Star Wars animations. Okay. That was one of the engines. Here we have another one. Goose Goose Go. Let's try that one. Let's try. <coughs> okay. So I think here the innovation was the logo, Natalie. Is that right? Or is there anything else to? Okay. Nice logo. <coughs> and you also, it's also responsive. It's also nice. Here's another one. This is, uh, so what else do we? Uh, Chat GPT, okay, it's already, yeah, we have an up-to-date language, Chat GPT, no in image available. You can click, you also get to the site. That's also just very nicely, neatly made and also quite responsive. And uh, what do we have here? That's another one inspired by the, also pretty responsive with a nice uh, table. And let me use this, uh, okay. Yeah, this uh, let me. This is a good example of a. Okay, ah, okay. This one stalls sometimes, right? I think we. Okay, but it's also interesting. It's actually not so easy to not make it stall because sometimes can happen that requests. I don't know. They start and then they don't end. You have to deal with all that. Here's another one. Let me try that one. Okay. Ah, here we have a little delay, but otherwise we also... Okay, and let me maybe go back to uh, this one where I just type a uh, name. So I completely messed up the name, which is uh, interesting. Let's go to uh, Wikidata, where you also have this search thing, and let me also just type Arnold. Yeah, and I don't find a match. So here... So apparently it's not so easy to make a nice search as you type interface with fuzzy search because otherwise they certainly would have done this. So we have in this exercise sheet man managed to do something with relatively modest effort which the Wikidata uh, website has not managed to do. So that's quite nice. So there were also some Easter eggs. So uh, let's first look at your... Uh, Reactions. I was impressed by what one can do. My favorite one was the asteroids. We will look at them in a second. Matrix. Scared that I was hacked. Many of you wrote that, so when you saw it for the first time, it didn't work for all of you. We also have a comment. Harlem Shake brought back some memories. Disappointed that I had to disable the gorillas, even though they did nothing wrong. Did not work because of the parsing I do of the JSON object. So for some of you, it didn't work because you did something different or you did something special. Some of you then realized <coughs> that there were these hidden uh, code injections in the data and then fixed it. Some of you were not able to fix it. Then you couldn't see the wonderful animations, but I will show them. Yeah, very cool what you can make a browser do, but also worrying. Many of you wrote that. I feel violated. The data betrayed me. Okay, let's look at them. So. Yeah, and let me also use the opportunity to show you this, the master solution. Let's type uh, the matrix. Okay, this is the matrix animation. So how does it, uh, yeah, so apparently, yeah, I mean, and it's interesting. So for those of you who haven't thought about it, what is happening? We gave you a big data set by typing the query and then locating a few matching entities, and then you are extracting part of the data, transferring here, and put, putting it in your HTML. But it's a big data set. You haven't looked at every byte, and somewhere in this data set, stuff is hidden. Apparently, in this case, JavaScript, and even pretty involved JavaScript, which can then do anything. And it's uh, not so easy to... Yeah, then we have uh, the gorillas. Let me see if that is... Okay, that was too grossly mistyped. Okay, now we have a whole video game here, which... Uh, no, I don't want to see the intro, which you can play. So <laughs> a little JavaScript, which plays a whole video game. Okay, angle here, I think, I don't know, 10, velocity, 40, 
Okay, I can throw a banana and try to... Okay, that was... Okay, maybe 70. Okay, no. Yeah, I think I won't play it too. Hmm. No, okay, you get it. Okay, that was gorillas. Can you hear the sound, people on uh, Zoom? Can you hear it? The next one was the... People on Zoom, yes, you can hear the sound. Okay, we have the Harlem Shake. Okay. I think... Yeah, let me check. The Harlem Shake is from 2013. Okay. So who remembers the Harlem Shake? That's nine years ago. I'm not sure if everybody in the room knows the meme. Yeah, it's also a nice one. Then we have uh, Windows. Okay, it's also nice. Actually, I had it yesterday, Frank, on my notebook. But the new blue, the real one, which was scary. We already saw the snow. In the last lecture, it's also in there. And uh, yeah, and some disabled. Uh, and then we have the turn around. Okay, another one. Yeah, it's it's all just JavaScript, right? Doing some interesting stuff. And the last one was uh, asteroids. Yeah, that was also interesting because some of you said nothing happened for asteroids. Just a triangle appeared on the. Well, it's not just a triangle. It's a it's a rocket and it's a game. Maybe that's uh, due to your age. I think it was one of the first video games, and of course you can shoot and kill some, yeah. <laughs> delete your page. Okay, so that was uh, that. So some nice injections there. ChatGPT, there was a question about ChatGPT. Let me first uh, show you what you wrote, and then uh, show you a little bit about ChatGPT, because I think it's quite significant. It's a language model designed and trained by a company called OpenAI, a pretty uh, small company, famously known to be called OpenAI, but to be not open, really that can have conversations in writing with humans. I really find it interesting. It's amazing how powerful it is. It is. I don't know what chat GPT is. You should. You absolutely should. It refused to prove that the Earth is flat. Good. It initially used the metric system. When I asked it to use a proper unit system, it switched to the metric system. Very nice. So it's, it's not just it can really have a conversation. We will see it. Was amazing, scared about my future as a software engineer. That's true. ChatGPT, I think, will change a lot. It's uh, quite revolutionary. Someone built, check out this link. It's amazing. And uh, I'm fascinated. This feels like a very large step. And I agree. So I will show it to you in a minute. The last time I had this feeling that something so significant happened when I in 1994, I still remember it, in my office, I tried the first web browser, Mosaic by Netscape. Who knows Mosaic by Netscape in the room? Have you even heard it? Okay, 1994, it's 1994, not 1894. Yeah, so you saw it, you saw the web browser, you saw the idea of a web and it was clear. You were wondering why is not everybody using it? Why is it not changing the world right now? And interestingly, it took a few more years, like five years. That's, that's quite interesting, really. You see something, you know, oh, wow, this is a huge step. But then nothing is happening for a while because it somehow takes a while for these things to, to spread around. And then four or five years later, the web, of course, changed the world. This is very similar, I think. It even tells jokes. Why can't the bicycle stand by itself? Because it's too tired. <laughs> And this happened in a conversation by someone where they talked casually about bicycles and stuff, and then a person said, do you know a joke? And then the joke was even a reference to the uh, conversation so far. So I've logged into ChatGPT here. Let me, uh, let me have a little conversation related to our lecture. How is the, and let me make it a little bit larger, how is the edit distance? between two strings defined. And I'm 
this is not prepared, I'm not doing anything special, I'm just asking chat GPT. Okay, and they're having a pretty heavy server load, so... And it's a language model, it's producing one word of a time depending on... Okay, between two strings is the minimum number, okay, the set of allowed include insertion, deletion, substitution. I get an example, kitten sitting, three, Okay, the important thing to understand, we will talk a little more about this in other lectures, it's just the language model, it's just producing the next word that's likely based on everything it has seen so far and what you have uh, typed so far. Is the edit distance uh, symmetric? <coughs> Let me just ask it that. is generally considered to be symmetric, meaning that this is the same generally considered, it's a, a bit strange. Mm. Okay, the operations are reversible. Mm. So that's a, that's a good argument, they are reversible. And, uh, and it's important, this is not text which is just copied somewhere, it's, it's made up on the fly as I, I do this. Uh, let's see, can you write a function in Python that computes, yeah, this will not work probably, right, the compute the, and uh, called, let me also say how it should be called, called edit distance that computes the edit distance between two given strings x and y. So let me even give the stuff name, right? Can you write a function in Python called edit distance that computes? This is like an exam question, right? Let's see what... Certainly, here's a simple implementation of the 11th in Python. Def edit distance x, y... <coughs> oh, it's writing code. It's using the names which I did. So, this is quite amazing, right? This is, And it's a language model. This is now not... Uh, going to some module which somebody specifically wrote for writing code in response, it's always just producing the next word based on the words we have already seen. Now you can... Is it correct? It's not necessarily correct. It's uh, actually not so infrequent, also wrong, sometimes subtly wrong, sometimes totally wrong, but... Okay. <coughs> And this is now the iterative solution, right? Doing the dynamic programming approach. And it's also a bit of a smarty pants, klugscheißer, it's always giving explanations you didn't ask for. Yeah, but why not? I mean, that's what you... It's actually quite chatty here. For example, the first i characters of x into the first... Okay, wow. I am uh, impressed. So let me refer to, uh, that was the dynamic uh, programming implementation. Can you also give me the... You can also do it recursively, which is much simpler. I think we mentioned it uh, in the lecture. <coughs> uh, and uh, please call it edit distance recursive. So let me give it a name so that it can't just produce something uh, which it already knew. So now I'm saying, can you also do it? Certainly, very confident, right? It's a very, here's a recursive. Edit distance recursive, x, y, i, j, the first string. So now let's, it should be a shorter function, right? Okay, the base cases are correct. If one string is empty, it's the length of the other string. If this is empty, it's the length of the other. And now you just should have three cases. Okay. Yeah, and it calls itself recursively three times. If you haven't looked at ChatGPT or played around with it, you have to because this is... Uh, it's quite revolutionary. What, and it's just... Uh, a language model. So should you take, you tell me, should, while I type the question, should one take the recursive implementation or the dynamic programming one and why?
please just tell me whenever you know it. Which one is better, the recursive one or the iterative one? The, it's also a, an exam question. Typical, uh, the dynamic, what's the problem with the, or the recursive one? <coughs> yeah, it needs, may. what's the running time of the recursive one? If you recall it recursively three times in every, let's see what ChatGPT said. So which one should I take? So it's uh, like more efficient, especially for round. This is because the dynamic programming stores the results in the table, reuses them rather than computing. This leads to a significant, okay. Levenstein, so the dynamic programming was is M times N, that's correct, it's like the, it's a quadratic, and the other one is 3 to the n. In contrast, that's also correct. I mean, if you don't find that amazing, then I don't know what. It's, uh, yeah, we could spend the whole lecture about this. This is, uh <coughs> and you have to understand, I don't know how much you know about long language model, this is just a language model. It means it was trained on a lot of data, and all it does is, Given what it has seen so far and what you have typed so far, predict the next word, predict the next word, predict, just predict the next word or part of word based on what you have seen. That's also why, so what you see here, this animated thing is not just a fake animation, but that's actually how the thing produces it, right? So while it produces the first word, it doesn't know what, so it's like I play a game, I start a sentence and then you continue it, the next words, and then you continue it. Just, I mean, people work like that too, like they just talk what comes to their mind and then they just form words and go on and on. So this thing is, yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing. So, play around with it. So now, before we go to the vector space model, let's have a bit more fun with encoding. And then we have a break, and then we go to the topic of today, which is a small topic, and just, we need only half a lecture for this. So where is my lecture seven? Yes, here it is. So we talked about Unicode. Unicode is a variable byte encoding. This was fairly easy to understand, I think. You have, uh, yeah, like every character, let me go back to that slide, let me uh, recapitulate that really quickly. A little bit of history here. Every character in Unicode has a number, right? A unique number. So 128,512 is a smiling face. And the question is, how do you encode that number? Because now you have, a, and of course, what you don't want to do, there is such an encoding, spend four bytes for, for every uh, character. You can do that, and that's actually called UTF-32, but that's extremely wasteful. Java sometimes does that. There's UTF-16 where you say, I don't need all characters, 65,536 is enough. Then you always have two bytes, but it's also extremely wasteful because usually for the typical characters, you need just one byte. So of course you want an encoding which uses few bytes, when you only need few bytes and more bytes when they are needed. And this encoding is called UTF-8, which for a long time now is the standard. And the nice thing is that you can understand it easily. We also had that in the last lectures. It connects to the lecture about encoding. So you have these leading bits which tell you, okay, is this a sequence of two bytes, three bytes, or four bytes? Then you have these continuation bytes which always start with one zero. And in a simple one uh, byte case, it's the same as the ASCII codes. So, and uh, we also looked at some nice uh, properties. This is also a popular exam question, like do this yourself or write a program about this. I give you a code point, for example, 228, and then tell me, you should be able to do that. It's a pretty easy exercise. I give you a code point, I tell you 2011, and you give me the UTF-8 code. So first you have to turn 2011 into binary, then you have to figure out, okay, is it one byte, two bytes, three bytes, and then you have to do the bit magic, and then you can 
shift that back into uh, decimal numbers. One trick I should maybe mention here, in case you didn't know that, if I have uh, this binary number here, what's the hex representation of that number? Or let, let's first do it in, let's do, just in, this is like basic uh, computer science stuff which you should really, really know. So f let's first do the 1, 2, 4, 8, this is uh, 16, 32, 64, 128. So let's make a decimal number out of it. So this is then 192, 98, 208, 209, I think, right? This should be 209. You should be able to do something like this in your head without a calculator. Something is not quite right with the pen here, but maybe if I... So now I want it in, uh, in decimal. Now how do I... what's the hex value? If I want hex, first how many hex digits does this number have? If I write it in hex, hexadecimal, yes? Two, and what are the hex digits? D1. D1, okay, it's D1 in hex. And how did you do it? I just look for the first four yes. bits and the last four bits and how many hex. Okay. What you can do, hexadecimal, it uh, has a range of 0 to 15, 16, so you can just take four bits, that's one digit, the other four bits, it's another digit, so this is one in decimal, which is also one in uh, uh, hexadecimal then, and this is, what is it in decimal, what we see here? 13? 13, yeah, it's 8, 4, and 1, so it's 13, and 13 is A is 10, B is 11, uh, C is 12, so this is uh, 13, yeah, so it's 13, which is a D. <laughs> and this is the kind of thing which is important to know, because if in an exam <laughs> you convert this to decimal, and now you do modulus 16 and divide by 16, you will also arrive at D1, but it will take you 5 minutes instead of 5 seconds. So it's important to know that. It's just a simple trick. And here's uh, also something worth knowing and important to know. You can certainly you have a UTF-8 sequence for every possible Unicode, but it's not the other way around. Not every multibyte sequence, for example, this looks good. It starts with 110, which means it's a two-byte UTF-8 code. Then I have a continuation byte, but still, this is not valid. And why is it not valid? Because the code point here, so the thing actually carrying information, is just seven bits. The other bits here are zero, which means you could have done it with just one byte. And that's true also for all the higher ones, right? If you use a long sequence and put in a code there, which could have done with less bytes, then this is actually invalid. That's just how the standard is defined. It could have been defined that, okay, when you use that sequence, it's just the same as the corresponding one byte sequence, but it's not valid. Yes, so that's important to know. And whenever you see this funny character, that's because when some encoder goes through a sequence, tries to, yeah, and, and invalid can also happen when the leading bytes are somehow messed up, right? If you have a zero, yeah, for example, you can't have one zero as the leading byte, right? That's also invalid. So that's also an interesting exercise to think about how to characterize all invalid sequences. So if, if it starts with one zero, it can't be a valid UTF-8 code. Okay, and here, so we had that. This you already needed for the exercise sheet, URL decoding. So what you, and for the URL decoding, because in the URL you have this limited character set, you first take the code in hex, which of course depends on the encoding, so the German umlaut R in UTF-8 is C3A4, 
which means when you URL encode it, so in a URL with limited character set, you just put a percent before the hex code, it looks like this. But when your encoding is this older ISO Latin or ISO 88591, then it will just look like percent %E4. So it depends on the encoding, how the URL encoding looks like. And here's one more thing, which you it's a skill which is really useful and which you should learn. And I want to show it to you. I'm not sure right now where. Let's maybe... Yeah, let's uh, just have some uh, file here with... Uh, Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah, yeah, let me... So there's this funny thing here in Python, which maybe you didn't fully understand so far. Let's play around with this so far to see how complicated this is. So let me do the following. So I'm just specifying this, which is also the default. And let's see in a second what happens if I change this. Actually, you should do this at the beginning of every Python file. This tells the Python e interpreter how it should interpret the bytes here. And now let's just, I don't do main or anything, let me just print an A here. And uh, yeah, let me just here, I just, uh, uh -huh. let me just execute the program here, xxx pi. Okay, and now it looks like this. This doesn't look like an A. And this stuff you see pretty frequently. You see it in emails which are quoted by other emails. Let me, you can see it, right? This is A tilde and some funny symbol. And the question is, why do you get that funny symbol? And now the interesting thing about encoding is, right now, I think there are five, I'm not even sure, five or six encodings going on here. There is. How is that string encoded in Python? And the basic thing you have to understand, there is sequences of bytes, and then there is how you interpret sequences of bytes. So here we have, how is this file even stored? How is this A stored in the file? This file here is a text file with bytes. How is it stored? Let's look at that. That was actually on one of the slides. The slides, in many ways, are also references, although I'm not always going through all the details. I use them myself a lot for that, so I know, oh, I did that in one of my lectures, and I just go there, and how does it work? This is a very useful tool for looking at a file in, in its byte view. So let me just do xxd, and maybe let me not call it, let me call it uh, encoding.py. And let's look at it again, and let me also, yeah. So that's what, let me look at the file, just at the contents of this file, which is a small Python program, and, and there it is. Okay, so this is, and let me, there are a few parameters here which I can choose, maybe in each column, show me four bytes, and show them in groups of one, that's on the, okay. So this is just the contents of the file. So here I just said, show me per line four characters and group them as one. So if I do group four, then it will group four together, but I want to see the individual codes nicely. But xxd is the thing to remember. So now what I see, I just see the characters here, right? So I see the hash. And what's interesting to me is what happens for the a here. And here I see a is actually two dots here. This is just how as printable characters. And here I see, ah, it's C3, A4, right? So apparently it used UTF-8, but that's not... Uh, so let's change this here. So will this change now? Will it change now or will it look the same? So the yardstick for whether you really understood these things is that you can say in advance, right, this is like the yardstick of uh, the test of knowledge. Can you say in advance what's going to happen, not afterwards? Will I get the same output now or will I get a different output? What do you think? Yeah, I will get the same uh, out. Of course, not for the ISO, this change, but here it's, 
Yeah, it's still C3A4. It's just uh, in, in different lines now. This is not how this is stored in the file. This is how the Python interpreter will interpret this. Let's see what the Python interpreter does now. Oh, now I get three characters and actually four because one is hidden. And actually I was a little mean because I changed the character. The, the terminal also has an encoding. You are sending stuff to the terminal. The terminal just gets sequences of bytes which are also interpreted, right? So now I set what the terminal does to UTF-8 here, right? So now everything the terminal get is interpreted as UTF-8. So let's see that. Let's go back to this again. So what we have now, now we have in the file, I have the R umlaut encoded as UTF-8, Python will interpret it as UTF-8, and when I print it to the terminal, I will see it as UTF-8. If I change this here to ISO-8859, now the terminal will get C3A4, <coughs> and it will interpret this as two characters. And in ISO uh, Latin 1, and let's just, let's just check that, because uh, let's look at the ISO 88591. This is for a computer scientist, it's like 65,536. You should absolutely know it by heart. Let's just look at the table. C3, you see, C3 is this A tilde. So that's why when you, uh, okay, donate to Wikipedia, C3 and the other one was, how was it represented, A4 or, yeah, A4, it's this one. That's, by the way, the generic currency symbol. So if you understand the encoding, then you actually understand why you're seeing what you're seeing, right? It's not just some random characters, it's actually the A, so this character, actually, do we have? Yeah, we have the A here. In UTF-8, the A is C3A4. It's a two-byte sequence. And if you interpret this as ISO 8A51, then the C3 will be interpreted as capital A with a tilde, and the A4 as the generic currency symbol, which is why you get this if this isn't interpreted like this. Now, let's go back to UTF-8 here. And this is actually really important to understand when you write code that does anything with strings and languages, because otherwise you get some mistake and then you are just, you are just hacking around. And there are so many sources where it could go wrong that you are spending a lot of time. So now I'm doing this, and now, yeah, I get this. So now Python is just interpreting this as, uh, and that's that's why I get this now. Uh, there's uh, another dimension. This is just how I can also set the. Yeah? Yeah? I think so. Yes. You are confused why you, why you get this. Yes, because okay, let's, yeah, I understand. Let's just see what, <coughs> so the contents of the file is like this. Yes. So I am, and actually, there's another, there are two more dimensions which I didn't talk about. One is how is the file stored? So the file encoding here, the file is stor storing this as two characters. And let's just, uh, I can change it in Vim with ISO 88591. And what I will see now, okay, and now I probably have to save it. Oh, now it says converted, see? That's also another frequent source of error. You're writing a file and you're typing all kinds of funny characters. Now the question is how is it stored on disk? So now it's only one character here, so it's E4. And now it's only E4, let's go to the table. E4 is actually a umlaut, right? So now by changing the, yes. So now I change the, and now, uh, yeah, what will we get now? Now we get an A, 
and we are in UTF-8 uh, here. Because that's another dimension now, and that's maybe your question. What this is just saying, how should I interpret the bytes in the file at this point? And the bytes in the file here uh, is one byte now, because I changed the file encoding to uh, ISO 8.8, which means Python now interprets it exactly in the way how the file is stored. But when Python outputs the string, it outputs it as UTF-8. Ah, okay. Yeah, that's still another dimension, how it outputs it. You can uh, actually, I mean, you could now, yeah, we saw that you could specify the encoding. I could do encode and decode. You can do now do a lot of things. So there is how is the file stored, how does Python interpret it, how does Python print it, then how does the terminal interpret it, and uh, then there's the editor, how the editor interprets it. And that's actually, that's I think another one. I think we now have six dimensions, and I strongly encourage you to play around with this yourself. So now it's, uh, did I do? I'm actually not sure. Ah, you see? Now I get a question mark here. Let's see. And this is why I showed you XXD, because it's very hard to understand what, what's happening now. What is it now? Is the editor storing? What's the editor storing now? That's, that may be hard to understand. Let's just look at the, the contents with XXD. So the editor is storing E4. And my uh, encoding is set to Latin 1, which is a synonym for ISO 88. And my file encoding is also set to, yeah. So the editor is now interpreting this as uh, Latin 1, as it should. But this is in a terminal which is set to uh, Unicode, right? So that's why it's displayed in a strange way here. Actually, in uh, yeah. I can see it here. If I do GA in, in Vim, I can see that's the character A4. So actually now everything is in sync here. So the file is storing it in ISO 88591. The editor is interpreting it that way, showing it that way, and Python is also interpreting it that way. But just the terminal is showing it in the wrong way. So if I switch to uh, this now, I don't know. If I... Ah, now I have to write it. If I now... Okay, now I get, uh, hmm. yeah, you see funny things happening here, right? A and these things can uh, pile up, as we saw. If you get these, uh, let's go be this the last thing we do. Let's maybe set the, what's the, no, I don't want arrow bells. Let's set the, oh, the encoding is back to UTF-8. It's some, ah, because I, left the editor, and when I entered it again, it shows the default encoding. Okay. And, uh, yeah, it's really tricky. But it's important to understand that these uh, things are going on. So let me, no, I actually want to convert this all back. And this is how the editor interprets it. What's this? Okay, this is the file encoding. This did not change. File encoding back to UTF-8. And uh, this is the last thing I want to show you. And then we continue with the make a break and continue with the other stuff. Let me just type the German umlaut again here. <laughs> okay, I've messed it up so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now I'm confused myself. I think I have to leave no, the editor. Oh, the terminal is still in. Yeah, you see. Yeah, but at least you know where to check, right? You know, I think the take home message is it's so confusing. There is the terminal interpreting stuff. There is how the file is coded, how the editor encodes it, how the editor interprets it, how the editor shows it, how the Python interpreter shows it. And you just have to know that all these things are at work. And then if you know that, then you at least know where to look at. So last thing we show, now it's again two characters, UTF-8, 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 UTF-8. That's of course the safe way. 
I now get it here. And now if I do interpret this as two characters and uh, here I also the terminal also interprets it and now I get four symbols, right? And you can even compute which one. Now it's here, it's two bytes in the file. Python will uh, interpret it as ISO, so as two characters. Then it will print it as UTF-8 and then the UTF-8 will in again be interpreted as ISO, which means why well, I get four characters here. One of them is invisible. And you see that stuff a lot when you're actually working with text and printing and in the web browser you also see these symbols and you wonder what's going on. So very useful knowledge, I think. Play around with it yourself, it's very interesting. Uh, also for reference, how you do it in the various programming languages. So every programming language has to handle it. This somehow in Python, uh, we have just seen this in more efficient languages. Yeah, you don't always want to waste too many characters. So in C++, you have string and then you have a W string when you use more characters. So you have another class for this and in uh, Java. And you have to pay attention what is now the length, right? This is also very important to understand and the frequent source of error. What is now the length of the string? Is it the number of bytes or the number of characters? So if you take this here, you get length two, which is pretty confusing because it's a three byte, <laughs> it's a three byte uh, UTF-8 sequence and you get length two. And why is that so? Because it's, uh, yes? Yeah, it's UTF-16 in Java, right? It's UTF-16, which means Java uses two bytes which works for most characters, but not for a smiley face, needs three bytes, so it needs two 16-byte uh, codes, which is the length, it's actually two and not one, as, as, you, as you would have expect. Is there a reason for the problem? No, this is just wrong. But it's good to ask because you never know, right? Maybe there is a, there's a reason for this. It's just a mistake. Thank you very much. <coughs> yeah. And also in Java, you can convert between take home message is really a lot of things going on. And if you have any problems there, you have to look deeper. And now uh, you know how to look deeper and how to understand. Yeah, and in Python, here are some more examples of, of what I, I showed you. <coughs> OK, any questions about Unicode or anything we did in the last two lectures before we now go to the next topic? Yes, please. Oh yeah, thank you. In the last line. Here? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, probably I was just thought just in case. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> and it becomes more complicated when you communicate with a web browser because then the web browser also has its own encoding and stuff. That's yeah? 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 Because a car, yeah, it's a very good question. The question was, why is it not one? A character in Java is a UTF-16, UTF-8-16 code, which is, if you ask me, a comp that was a very bad design decision. So the character in Java is a UTF-16 code and not really a character, which means this is two characters. So a character in Java, car, is not what you think it is. It's not an actual character, it's a UTF-16 code, which means some characters have two characters in Java, which I think was a terrible design decision, but I'm sure they had their reasons for it. But the problem is, and you know when you, like us, when you build real search engines and stuff, and you really want to do it efficiently, that's not easy because then you have to deal with UTF-8 and doing that in a language like C++, not easy. 
and there are so many more questions. So in a company like uh, Google, I've worked at Google for some time a while ago, you have a whole department dealing only with Unicode. It's a big department, they're doing only this stuff because it's so complex but so important, right? You want to display and handle this stuff proper properly. Any other questions before we make a break and go to the next topic? Okay, let's make a break. Five minutes and then next topic, which will be relatively short. Yeah, back to lecture eight, vector space model. So we just have nine slides. And this is now the start of something new, connecting to what we have done earlier, but we are now going into the wonderful, beautiful, enchanting world of linear algebra. And this is a very lightweight introduction into this before the Christmas break and also the exercise sheet will be very lightweight and we deliberately made this an own small lecture so that it starts easy. So we will now represent documents as vectors. Here's our running example for today. You have to understand it but it's easy to understand. So it's a, we have six documents or text records and so each column here is a document and the rows are now words or terms as they are usually called in this context, the term T-E-R-M. So this just means this document contains the word internet once, the word web once and the word surfing once and so on. And this is like the term frequency we had in the first and second le lecture which means D4 contains the word surfing twice. And maybe, maybe before we uh, continue, let's just, uh, mm -hmm. this is uh, our, and let me just make it example txt because I don't have columns here. Let me, uh, just if I have a file with one line per text record, let's just check how that file would look like. So the first document has the words internet, and let me just write them here, and we will write code for parsing it, web surfing, right? That's the first document, internet web surfing. The second one is internet surfing. The third document is web surfing. This one is internet web surfing, surfing beach. So let's, uh, so it's like this. And actually the order of the word is not important, so I could also have a totally different order. So you have the word surfing twice, so I just uh, in this order. So now I have surfing with a two, and now I have two documents which are the same. Why not? Two documents can be the same, and they are both about uh, beach surfing. Yeah, surfing beach, let me do it like this surfing beach, and this one is the same, but the words in different order, but it's the same document for our purposes. Also how we did it so far, remember, it didn't matter in which order uh, they occurred. We didn't have some of you in their extensions considered proximity, but here we actually ignore the order. So this is exactly the document collection we see here. And also understand why I chose this example this will be important for the next lecture, but it's also, I have here two words which mean more or less the same thing, and one word that's called a polysem, which means different things in different contexts. But that's not important for today, but for the next lecture. But that's the reason for the peculiar example. These are synonyms, words which mean the same thing basically, can be used interchangeably, serving as a polysem, means different things in different contexts. And language is full of these different ways to say the same thing and the same thing meaning different things in different contexts. Okay, and the zero entries, so in this example we have relatively few zero entries. If you think about a real collection, here you will have basically all the words in the dictionary and most documents only contain a fraction of them, which means you have a matrix which is full of zeros, mostly zeros, not in this toy example, and that's important, and we will see in a second why. 
and we just use TF scores, so it's just uh, whole numbers here which just say how often does the word occur. For the exercise sheet you will use PM25 scores. <laughs> you can also write 0 0.14 here, right? Then it just has a different meaning. Okay, so this is often referred to as the vector space model. Why? Because, yeah, these things are now uh, vectors here in this case a document is a four-dimensional vector, so we can just see them as points in a four-dimensional space. The whole thing becomes a matrix if you write them side by side and then you are in linear algebra world. So in this case you have four vectors in four-dimensional space. So it's a vector space. And this is the term document matrix. Of course you could also have a document term matrix, but that's just historically one has the terms in the rows, the documents and the columns, and one calls it like this, so let's also call it like this. And a term for our purposes is really just a word, so they are also synonyms. So let's see, what's, yeah, is it, are we just being fancy or does it have an advantage? It has lots of advantages and will be fascinated, it's fascinating to explore this, to write these things as vectors and matrices. Let's first start with something uh, very simple. Now I have my six documents and this is a query and the query is just where I have a one, this is the word in my query. So this is if I type, if you think of exercise one or two, I type web surfing now and I want my hits web surfing. And now let's not compute the hits with an inverted index, but by doing little linear algebra. So I'm now taking the dot product of these vectors. And let's just uh, do it. So let me take the dot product of this vector here with this vector here. And you tell me what's the dot product. Dot product is component-wise multiplication and then adding it up. What's the dot product? Yeah? Two, yeah. The dot product is two. It's one times zero plus. Uh, we do it with the array once slowly. One times zero plus one times one plus one times one plus zero times zero. What's the dot product here? You tell me the dot product. <laughs> Someone else maybe, huh? One. one. How does it go on? Two. two. Three, one, and one because it's the same vector. Okay, so these are now our scores, <coughs> and they should look familiar to you because it's exactly the TF scores in the second lecture slide 11. Before we introduced IDF, this was exactly what we did. Think about it. So if you take D4, for example, my query is web surfing and I have web here with a score of 1 and surfing with a score of 2 and it's just adding them up. It's just what we did in lecture 2 but now with linear algebra. So just writing a query like this and computing the dot product gives you the exact same thing. And now this is actually something you can do in uh, linear algebra and we implement this together now but before we do it you should understand the most basic thing about linear algebra, maybe it's a bit rusty for you, then it will, we will unrust it in the next lecture. Let's write this vector as a row vector. So let me write it like this. That's now my 0, 1, 1, 0. Actually, I don't need commas. One usually doesn't write commas when one writes a vector. So this is now uh, my QT, right? This is my and transpose because below it's a, a, a row vector, now it's a column vector, and let me write my matrix now. Let me just, let's take this time, let's do it slow for once, although it's very easy, but, but it's important to understand it. So this is the one, I'm just copying the matrix now. The matrix, not that matrix, but the matrix below, zero, one, one, two, one, and then I have twice zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, one. And now let's just to 
And this will be, so this is now our matrix uh, A, like it's below. Let's also look at the dimensions here. What are the dimensions here? This has one row and four columns. And this has four columns, uh, four rows and six columns. Basic rule of multiplication in linear algebra, this has to match. So this only works if this is equal to this. Then you can do the multiplication. And now let's just do the matrix vector multiplication. So first, what will be the outcome? The outcome will be a 1.6, a 1 times 6 vector, right? And deliberately, it's just you multiply 1 times 4, 4 times 6. How does it work? Let's also do this very slowly. So let's just, uh, I'm taking this here and multiply it with this here and then I get the first entry. And the first entry is, what's the entry here? 2, yeah. <coughs> and let me, if I multiply it with a second column, I get the second entry, which is 1, which is what we have seen. Uh, yeah, let me take the third one here, and I get the, uh, which is 2, and so on. And the other ones, let me just write them in blue. We already had them before, so it will be 3, 1, 1. <coughs> These are exactly our scores from the previous slide. This is, it's very simple, but it's just something you have to understand and it should come very easily that when you are doing a vector matrix multiplication or matrix vector multiplication, when it fits, you are just multiplying the vector with the rows or columns of the matrix. If I would write this as a, a column vector on the other side and it fits, then it would be the columns multiplied. So this here would not fit, for example, right here, six width, so in this format, I just wrote it like this to show it it's the same dimension. That's why I have to transpose it and put it on this side. Could also have done A transpose times Q, it would also work, then I would get the result as a row vector. So that's the important message here. Quite simple, but you should understand this. You should be able to do this with no effort. Vector mul matrix multiplication is just multiply the vector with every row or column, depending on the order. And then you get the scores. You get the same thing as we have seen in the first or second lecture. And you get it with a linear algebra operation, which is great. So in the second, and, and we will see a little bit of this now, in the first lecture we did loops and kind of stuff. Now you just write, and let me write this here, it's already written on the slide. This is just QT times A. So I have a query and it's just one <laughs> linear algebra operation and I get all my results. And this is the whole magic also later for the learning stuff when you do deep learning, you just do one operation and it does all kinds of stuff. And this can be a whole document collection, right? Can be a million documents with 10,000 terms. Still it's just one operation. And if that is implemented efficiently, which it is, uh, then this can be quite fast. So let's implement this together now. So let's go to our code. And I've already copied it to save some time here, and because it's boring anyway. This is exactly, almost exactly our code from the first lecture, which does nothing, I think, because I, yeah, I just have to give it a file, uh, in this case, example.txt. I've also copied this. I made a little change. If you, uh, 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 let me just make this, no larger than it has to be. This is, uh, in the first lecture, we had a file with many columns, and you should also do it like this again for the exercise sheet. Here I just have just the text record, not the additional info and the title and so on. So it's just two, th that was our example collection from lecture one or two. It's a movie movie, a film movie. Let's look at the unit test here when I build the inverted index. The word A occurs in document 1 and 2, correct, lines 1 and 2. Uh, we lowercase everything, so 
a capital or lowercase let letter doesn't matter. Film occurs only in document two, correct, movie. And here also note, let's do the repetitions again. It's like a lecture one, just for the sake of demo. It occurs twice in document one, so one, one, three. Let's just check whether the unit test works by just doing it a simple way, inverted. No, it doesn't. Oh yeah, because I didn't, oh, because I renamed the X file. Yeah, I renamed it to example txt because it's not a column, doesn't have columns anymore. So my, yeah, <coughs> so that works. So it's just building the inverted index. And now let's do the following. Let's uh, have a function <coughs> build term document matrix. And it doesn't, it's a member function, it just takes the inverted index and turns it into a build a term document matrix from the already constructed inverted index. Okay, and let's not write a Okay, we want to build a term document matrix. We need to know the dimension. So let's make a, a few amendments here. Let's do here. We somehow need the number of terms. And note I'm speaking of terms now, not of words, because it's called term document matrix. And I also need the number of docs. Let me, we used to call them text record. Now they are called documents. I already changed that here, record ID to doc ID doesn't really matter, right? I'm just calling them documents now because this thing is called a term document matrix and not a word text record matrix. Yes? Yeah. That's a very good question. How do we, so in our matrix, this year is of course just written for explanation. We just have the matrix, right? So we need to store somehow if we have document identifiers, we have to store them. And the terms we will actually store. And actually, let's do it right now, since you ask. Let's explicitly store the terms. And how do we do it? And, and we will see in a second why this is useful. So how do we store the terms? Let's just do it. Let's just store them in the order we encounter them first. And we actually already have that here. So here is if we see a term for the first time, if it's not yet there, and here we can just do self terms append term. <coughs> so now in the end, uh, self terms will just be the four terms. In the, <coughs> and let's also check that. So terms should be which array? So what's the order? We have four terms, I think. No. Three. In which order will we have them if we do it like this? Yeah? A movie film, yeah, exactly. It will be in that order, just by the way we did that. This is also always something, typical problem when you work with these things. You, it's, here it's a hash set, but you, get the, you, you have to pay attention that you get them in a certain order. That's why I write sorted here so that I can test it because in the dictionary they are sorted in any order. But here we want a particular order. And here, of course, it's important. You can't just change the order of the, I mean, at, unless you also change the order the same way for the query. It's important which row belongs to which word when you interpret it later. Okay, we also have to, we need to know the number of terms. Oh, it was already written here, I forgot to, delete that, self uh, num terms. Yeah, what's the number of terms? I have this uh, inverted list, which is just a map of words to a vector. So it's just the length, the size of this thing, right? So it's just this here. This should give me the term. And the number of docs, how do I get the number of docs given this code? you look at the code, what's an easy way to get the number of docs? Uh, 
maybe someone else, but thank you. Yes? Yeah, it's just doc ID, right? I start with doc ID zero, I increase it every time I see a new document. So let's just doc ID and let's include it into the test. Let's do it here. So it's a self num terms self num docs. And for this example, it should be we have three terms and three docs. Okay, it's both three, but that's just how it is. Let's check it. No, it doesn't. Oh, no, it's not self here. It's the inverted index. Okay. Yeah, it works. So now we have, uh, okay, now let's not create our, let's start with, uh, let's start simple. And now we use something, a library, the linear algebra library of Python, and it's called NumPy. I will talk a little more about NumPy in a second. Let's just use it for the moment. Let's just create an empty matrix with zeros with the right dimension. And there's actually a NumPy function for this zero. And I just tell it uh, how many rows, that's the number of terms, and how many columns, that's the number of documents. Can you say it? Oh yeah, it's a cell, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for paying attention. And uh, this function just builds it and yeah, let's uh, return it or yeah, let's do it like, I don't know. Yeah, let's do it like this. Build turn document matrix. So uh, build the term and show it and some other stuff. I will now show a few things. So let's uh, let's get it here. I, I built, um, you will get this code. You can't use it one-to-one -one for the exercise sheet, but it will be useful. We will give it to you. And let's just uh, do some prints now. So this is now the term document matrix A. And let's just print it and see what happens. Now I would expect to see a matrix with the right dimension of, uh, yeah, let's just try it. Inverted index with my example, txt. Okay, I now reading from file, okay. Yeah, I don't think I, hmm. yeah, why not, why not? Okay, it's now a matrix with all uh, zeros. First thing we should do before we continue, and now I'm not sure, this is ugly, right? So it's writing it at zero point something, very important when you play around with it or you want to debug it, you want to look at it in a nicer form. So now I have to, and I'm and Natalie pre prepared to help me because I, I know yeah, that's very, you can say how should matrices be printed, you can give it a formatter. Let me just try to guess like a language model how it could, so now I'm chat GPT. Okay, I think you should say for these are floats and for the float, you probably have to specify a lambda function which says how should I, okay, let me, let me try, x, and now the x should, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Now you should say how you format it. Maybe let's do 4.1, use four characters for each thing and one after the dot, and then maybe, and this should probably not be curly braces, but uh, something like this, x. <coughs> now let's see whether this is probably wrong. Yeah, it was wrong. So incomplete format. Okay, maybe some of you is, uh, so what could be wrong here? Float formatter equal. <coughs> Natalie, do you see what's wrong? Does anybody see what's wrong? Formatter. So I just want to say, how do I print the characters? Ah, I thought, let's see, maybe, Sometimes it pays to, uh, 
I, I'm not, I usually don't read the error messages. When I get an error, then I just go into the code and see what I did wrong. <coughs> yeah, this is the field by itself, writing compilers are so bad at writing error messages. Incomplete format. Lambda x, what did I do wrong? Okay, let me, I don't get uh, numpy set print options. Let's see, example. <coughs> Oh, well, we have ChatGPT, I should, uh, how, why am I even using Google anymore? How, uh, can you give me an example usage of NumPy set print options for float? Certainly, <laughs> of course. Let's see. Oh, I, I typo, print options. Let's see whether it can do the typo. You could actually copy the line and ask what's wrong. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. I, I should, could have done that. <coughs> Certainly, here's an example of how to use to change the way printed. NumPy, NP, set precision, set precision 3. Ah, okay. Yeah, 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 that's not what I wanted. <coughs> Okay, and okay, but uh, that's not what I wanted. I wanted it with a formatter equal. Oh, oh, it's doing okay. It, it's even reading my mind. Float custom formatter return. Oh, it should be return probably. Okay, yeah. Maybe it's, is it return here? Is it return? I don't have to return it. Uh, okay, I want it with, uh, okay, okay. Here is uh, what I tried and it didn't compile. Can you fix it? And let's just take it. I have no idea where this will. This would be most amazing. <coughs> and it didn't compile. Can you fix it? <coughs> and you can also help me in case chat. Yeah, you know what it is? I think there is missing an F option 4.1. Oh, there's an F missing. You're completely right, yeah. Now that you say it, let's see what... Uh, oh, now it's sweating. <laughs> Now it's a, uh, it looks like the syntax error in the code. This is uh, quite amazing, right? It, uh, 4 point F, I mean, it recognized the problem and I mean, this is uh, eerie. That's a, uh, I don't know, is it even giving me the, yes, oh, it's giving me the correct version. It, it can't, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is not, a, this is a real, uh, yeah. So, apocalypse is near. Yeah, there we go. So, yeah, let me just say this, I mean, nobody, like Google, since its inception, 1999, it didn't have a competitor, right? Basically, everybody who came afterwards didn't have a chance anymore, as long as it stuck with this uh, keyword search thing. This will now change uh, everything. I mean, if you have this, why should you go to Google and do a keyword search? You rather paste this, can you correct this, what's wrong? I mean, people will, even tech people, you, you prefer this. And it's not that Google hasn't tried to do something like this. So it's not, uh, so this, uh, I am sure, will change the world. And it, it will, all, it's, it's a major threat for Google, the first one in over 20 years. So very interesting times. Yes, please. How, how will they improve the advertisement? Will they give you in the future something like, I don't know, 
Oh, the question is how do they make money, OpenAI? So OpenAI is this company which is famously called Open, but it's not open. They are the precursor to this, this is called ChatGPT. The precursor are these language models GPT and they were already monetizing them. So what GPT, the previous models which were not for conversation mode, were already extremely good at is writing text and summarizing. They're extremely good at summarizing, which is a big business. You have, you have an application, 20 uh, pages. P summarize this. Summarize this, colon, text, and it will give you a nice uh, summary, which is uh, most, uh, most amazing. No, it doesn't belong to Google. It's a, it was founded as an open non-profit organization, but then they were overwhelmed by their own success and turned to somewhat profit pretty quickly. So OpenAI, <laughs> yeah, but it's really like this. So it, it's, it's a very interesting uh, company because what they, let, let me show you a little bit. They have this blog which you should absolutely read because, I mean, for years now they have to, they have also produced these, uh, like playing games. Dali is also by them, producing pictures automatically. But also a while back they, uh, they had this sentiment analysis. We have worked on that. I don't know how far. And, and what they are... Where's the sentiment? Unt unsupervised? Ah, interesting. Yeah, it was... Okay. Yeah. Is this here? Yeah, yeah, this was a thing five years back where they would just do sentiment analysis. You have a text and then you color each letter depending on the... So this starts very positive, so a typical passive-aggressive way. You start very positive and then pfft, and you say what you really think. So worse disparity, blah, blah. A and what, they, what I wanted to show is they have this blog where they talk about their stuff pretty early. So they've done something, they've achieved some breakthrough and they communicate it, but not necessarily with papers. Papers also come, with, but with very accessible blog posts that everybody can understand, also journalists, but also tech people. And as you saw on the previous list, they had a lot of these uh, posts. And initially it was just interesting stuff, but pretty quickly they had stuff which actually worked and which was useful like the language model, the GPT, and then they started on the side to monetize this, and now they're actually already now earning a lot of money. They don't have to worry. So GPT has a web API, so as a company you can just say, I want to use this for summarizing whatever in our, and then you just pay for it, like <coughs> 100,000 summaries, so and so much. and. Uh, <coughs> so that's one way to monetize this, just have... Uh, and the big advantage they have, let me also say this, <coughs> and that's also interesting, that will also change the world somewhat because right now you had this, ad with Google and these companies came the advertising business, right? Because how do you monetize a search engine that's free? You do it with advertisements, advertisements, here it's different because to compute this language model, this took cost like many million dollars, right? Which is a protection by itself. We can't do it. You can't train such a language model, even if you understand how it works technically, because you need 1,000 GPUs, a lot of energy, and millions of dollars, and a university. So, so these companies can do it. And then once you have the model, then of course it's very precious, but then you just... Uh, say here's an API, you can ask the model, we have it and, and you pay per API call. And now this is actually the first time that it, they made such a demo public. It will not be public forever, I think. At some point this will be behind a pay. So, so use it while, while it's still there. I don't think this will be public forever. So possible models will be like you pay something, you, you log in, you pay per request, I don't know. Interesting times, this will change a lot. And it fixed our error. Quite amazing. But you also fixed it in parallel. But very soon, of course, we will not be able to compete. 
So we have set the, I, I'm amazed that it fixed this. So now we have, okay, here it's now, and actually we only have integers here, so let me just set this to 0.0 and uh, maybe this should be enough, I think. Yeah, now I have a nice one. And now, huh, let me just run it on the one which I already created. Let me just uh, show it here again. That was the example two, which was exactly the one from the lecture, right? And let's just look at the term document matrix. Okay, oh no, that was the doc test, I'm sorry. Okay, it's all zeros now, L let's fill it with live. And then we are almost done for this lecture. So it's all zeros. This is just to create the right dimensions. Well, what do we do? We should go through our, I think we should go through our terms for a term in self terms. So we want to go through the terms in order and note how I did it. What's the order of the term? Internet, web, surfing, beach. Internet, web, surfing, beach. So they occur for the first time in the exact order I had them on the slide. So that was deliberate. So I can just iterate over the terms here. And actually I want the term. I also want the index. So let me do it like uh, this term. Is it i comma term or term comma i if I do enumerate? I'm not sure. If you know it, just tell me. Enumerate in Python also gives you the index. I'm, I'm not sure right now. Okay, now I have this and now I have the inverted lists in each order. So let me go through four and the inverted lists. Up here I have them in the unit test. They are just uh, sequences of doc IDs, one, one, three and so on. So for doc ID in self inverted lists term. So I need the term and the index here. And maybe let me not call it term, but uh, I, but term ID. And now I can just set colon here, a term ID doc ID. I just set it to one. So in my inverted list, so what am I doing here? I meet this one here, which just means the term movie occurs in document one, so I just write a one there in my matrix. So <laughs> you see, very little code. The exercise sheet will be like that, super little code. Let's just do it. Unfortunately, it's wrong. What did I do wrong? Let's not ask chat GPT. Let's think for ourselves for a change. Index out of bounds. Look at this code and tell me why the index is out of bounds. What do you think? Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we started counting the doc ID with one, and of course, when you use it for indexing, it's all zero based. So here in the enumerate, it's right, but here we should take. So for a change, this was an error message which was useful. It also happens sometimes. Okay, that looks almost like our matrix, but only almost. What's uh, Yeah, we should, this is just setting it to one. If you see it for the second time, we also set it to one. We start with an all zero matrix. So with a very small change, whenever I see a word again, and it happens, like in this example, one, one, three, then I want for this entry in the term document matrix a two. So let's just do it. And there we have it. There we have our term document matrix. Now let's just do, and that, that will be it for the coding already. Let me, uh, yeah, let me also set our query vector. So how do I set a vector? Actually in NumPy there are arrays and matrices and you shouldn't use matrix, which is super confusing, but you should use array. Matrix has its problems. There's something on the slides about this, but just follow the example for now. So let's, uh, it's this, it's a column vector now. I just write it like this. I initialize it with a Python array. And uh, yeah, let's just do it, print. And let me just copy these two lines. So this is my query vector Q. 
which is a row vector. And let's just see it. There we go. Yeah, so it's my query vector. And now let's uh, multiply it to get our scores. Let me just copy it again, so now we get scores. And what do we do? We just do the dot product of q with a. And I use a function dot, you don't use a, so it's not like this. It's a, you write it like this in function notation. Actually, if you use NumPy matrix, then uh, you could use the dot notation, but matrix has all kinds of problems. And it's a bit confusing that NumPy has matrix and array. So this is just computing the dot product, so one linear algebra operation. It's even doing it efficiently. This is actually, now it's small matrices, it doesn't matter. This is not doing like two loops in Python and then doing the computation, but this dot function is something which is written in C or even Fortran, or I don't know what language they had uh, 50 years ago. Linear algebra stuff is, o is often written a very old code. But it's, it's anyway, it's compiled machine code, which is just, and you have a nice interface. So this will be fast, also when the matrices are quick. And now I see the scores which we have seen. And as you can imagine now, now I can do the exact same thing which we did for lecture one and two. We can just do it with one matrix operations. And we will see that recurring in the next lecture. Stuff we did earlier and more complicated stuff, just a few linear algebra. Uh, operations which handle maybe large matrices uh, do it. And also note one thing here, so why didn't I do a dot q? Does it work? No, it doesn't. And it tells me exactly what I expect, right? a is a 4 times 6 matrix, q is a 4 times 1, doesn't write 1 here and doesn't match, right? The second dimension here should match the first dimension here. I would have to transpose A and then it works. So probably this would work, transpose. I'm not sure whether it's transpose or transpose. Yeah, now it works again. So this also works, but uh, let me write it the other way around because it's shorter. Say it again. Point T in the in the old one which I deleted now. Ah, point T. Yes. Ah, yeah. There's a shortcut for this. Yes, that's true. There's a shortcut for this. Actually, now that you are mentioning it, this will not be the last lecture where we use NumPy. It's the first lecture in a series of lectures. NumPy is really, if you do machine learning already now or later, you will use NumPy a lot. It's just the linear algebra library of uh, Python, and it's quite good, easy to use. And we've prepared for the NumPy documentation is quite big because you can do so much with linear algebra. algebra. We have over the years created a cheat sheet with the most typical stuff which you need. So here, you may want to go to that document when you use the ex do the exercise sheets, and uh, there's always a link to the reference. And here you see SciPy, because there are actually two libraries, and I will come to that in a second. But wh what I wanted to say now, there's this cheat sheet on the wiki with the most basic stuff which you need for the exercises. So if you're wondering how does one do this or that, I will come back to the exercise sheet in a minute. You may want to look at the sheet sheet first. <coughs> so that's what we did, numpy array and dot, not star. Yeah, we, we did all that. <coughs> this is how you can install it. If you use our virtual machine, it's already there. <coughs> so that's the last important thing. <coughs> I told you that in the beginning, <coughs> in our toy example, we have few zeros. If you think about a real matrix, most of the entries will be zero. 
and you simply, so even for the data sets which we have in this lecture, which are not huge, if you store the whole document matrix like this with real zeros, <coughs> it would be too much, right? You have, because it's like quadratic, right? Not quadratic, one also calls this quadratic, you have something times something else. That's just too big even when the some things are not huge. You have a million documents here, you have 10,000 here, that's already 10,000 times a million, it's 10 billion, like 10 giga, if you need 8 bytes per thing, you already have 80 gigabytes just for a, and a million documents is nothing, it's a toy collection. So you can't do this, but fortunately most entries are zero, and there's something called, and you should absolutely use that for the exercise sheet, a sparse matrix representation. It's actually very easy. So this very same conceptually very simple things in this lecture. Let's just uh, give the rows indices here and let me use this color. This is row 0, 1, 2, 3 and also let me give the columns colors. So this is uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You start with 0. Whenever you have indices you start with 0. And what do we have uh, now? Now this just says the entry in the matrix at 0, 0 should be 1. So it's just entry, column, index, row, index, a very simple format. You just say for every, you just specify the entries which are non-zero by just giving the index pair and the entry. So here 2, 3, entry 2, uh, 3 is just 2. That's what it says. And they are highlighted in bold here, the ones I have in the list. Of course, if you have a dense matrix where you have very few or no zeros at all, that would be a terrible representation, right? Because you are, then you would rather store it as a dense matrix. But if you have few entries, then this is a good representation. Yes, please? Ah, interesting. The question is, let's assume we have a matrix where most of the entries are 52 and only a few are different. Could you then also say the default entry is 52, I'm not storing it, and that just the others I'm giving explicitly? At first, you can do it with uh, linear algebra hacks, of course. I'm not sure whether you can do it. What you could do is you could just write your matrix plus 52. If you just do plus 52, then it would just add, and then you have to subtract 52 from the... So there are certainly hacks to do this, but I don't know if you can... I would say yes, because NumPy and SciPy, they are so... they have functions for everything. So if there's anything where you wonder, can you do it? You can probably do it. There's probably one one liner which can do amazing things and it pays off to learn a little bit about this. So this is a simple representation. Note that you have a choice here. Do you do this in row by row or column by column? So this is known as a row major or column major. And here's a very interesting thing. Very simple but very important to understand it. Let's do row major, which means I'm storing it row by row. Row by row means first all the non-zero entries of the first row, of the second row. Well, it's easy to see. If I store the entries of the first row, I basically get the inverted list for internet, right? It's just in our inverted list, we didn't bother to store the documents which don't contain the word. We say, oh, there's also this document that doesn't contain internet. We only store D1, D2, D4. <coughs> which means, if you have row, major order, row by row, then 0, 1, 3 is just my inverted list for the term 0. <coughs> 0, 2, 3 is just my inverted list for the term 1. 0, 1, 2 is just my inverted list here, and here I have my term frequency. So, row major, and this is so simple but interesting and, and very good to know, sparse row major representation is just like the inverted list concatenated. It's just the same thing. 
and also has the same memory consumption, and it's just good to know that it's like this. And of course, in, in NumPy or SciPy, you can specify DOA, and I think the default is always row major. And of course, let me come to that in a second. This is unfortunate, but for a historical reason, NumPy was doing the basic stuff, and then more advanced stuff was in a library called SciPy, Scientific Python. So there are two libraries, NumPy and SciPy, they overlap a bit. They're both about linear algebra. It's a bit unfortunate, it should be in one library, but historically it's two. So for sparse matrices, you need SciPy and not NumPy. But you also use NumPy and SciPy, so SciPy builds on NumPy. And now it's important, it's on the slide, so you have heard it, when you construct the sparse matrix, don't, absolutely don't do it like this. This just did it for demo purposes. That's the worst way to construct a matrix. That's super slow. I have two loops in Python. Just imagine this is 10,000 terms, 100,000 documents. It will take forever. You should absolutely use some built-in stuff. And the built-in stuff here is I give three arrays, which is if you go back to this picture, it's all, the, it's all the first entries here in one array, all the blue entries in one array, and all these in one array. And then I tell uh, SciPy, make a matrix out of these three. Right? CSR is just, uh, should be written here, compressed sparse row. It's row major representation. So there's also uh, yeah, compressed CSC, probably how it's called. Yeah. So you can do this, so you have to create a sparse matrix, and then you can do the same thing, q.a, but now this will be efficient even. I mean, you can try it with a dense matrix, and it will take forever. If you do it with a sparse matrix, it will be fast for, because as I said, this is actually machine code. And the last slide, and then um, if you have questions, I will be happy to answer them. Now that you have a matrix, you can do normalization stuff and let's just go to the to this one here back to this one what did we do in lecture two we might we did idf what is idf for one term multiply all entries by something because maybe this is a frequent term multiply it by something small this is a rare term multiplied by something larger and we did it with a loop when we did this, like multiply all entries here by some factor to emphasize or de-emphasize the term. This is, in, in matrix speak, this is like normalizing the row, divide a whole row by something. This is in linear algebra called normalization. And uh, let's look at for this exercise sheet for, as for normalization. So what you can do, you can normalize each row or each column su such that a certain norm is one. What is a norm? For example, you could just sum up the entries by ignoring signs. That would be the L1 norm. Just multiply my entries such that they, if they're all positive, sum to one. L2 norm such that the squares sum to one. And you can do that for the columns or for the rows. So you have four possibilities. That's also interesting because implementing the norm in Python, you have to think a little. It's, it's again these one or two liners, but uh, yeah, it, it's fun to play around with it and find how to do it. And never do these things with for loops. That takes forever. Find the operations which, which do it fast for you. And let's go to the exercise sheet. Should be there now. Yeah, there it is. So the exercise is, uh, I'm not reading it, just showing it here. Just take exercise sheet two, how we did it for, exercise, uh, uh, for lecture one now in the lecture. Take the code from there and now change to a linear algebra word. To the exact same thing, and that will be very little code. Like for our lecture here, this is basically what we added and, and <laughs> then we can do when we do answer a query with just two q dot a. So it's, it will be like that in all the next lectures. Uh, clever code, but very little code. And then just try out the four combinations. And I've given the name here because you should have an, 
command line argument. When I pass RL2, it just means normalize the rows by L2 norm. When I say CL1, normalize the columns by L1 norm. Just try out all four and see maybe one of them gives better results than BM25. It's a very lightweight exercise. I mean, you have still have a few days before Christmas, few days afterwards. It's, it's not much, it's a very lightweight intro into linear algebra world. That's it from my side. Are there any questions right now? Natalie, do we have a Q&A session on Friday? Yeah, we have a... Maybe we should check whether anybody wants to come, but... Yeah, well, we can have a short one, why not? So I guess there will be one on Friday. If you have any questions, you should come. It's, uh, it's fun and it's short and you can participate via Zoom, so low effort. Any question for now? So, ah, there's a question, yes. Advantages or disadvantages for row or column major? Yeah, that's a very good question, and I think we can answer it. Certainly, <laughs> like ChatGPT, <laughs> of course. Yeah, and actually you can see it here in this picture, I think. It depends on what you do with the matrix. So let's assume I'm doing these operations a lot, then a column major would be good, right? Because I'm, the question is, just think of this as a thing with 100,000 entries. And then when I do this multiplication, I'm going through these 100,000 entries. And now the question is, are they contiguous in memory or are they spread out in memory? The difference will be a factor of 100. So this operation will be much faster if it's in, in column major than in row major. So memory layout, if you have huge data, plays a big role. And yeah, you have to make a... So in this case, column major would be better. But for the exercise sheet, you can ignore it. But why not try it out and see if you see a performance difference? That would be a worthwhile thing to try. Any other questions? So, then I wish you happy and relaxing holidays and see you next year. Bye-bye. <coughs>